All righty. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another Master Gardeners class. Today we have Jonathan Propp, and he's going to be talking about summer gardens and what went wrong. Uh, go ahead and type in your questions throughout the talk via chat, and then we'll address them towards the end of the talk. So, Jonathan, the floor is all yours. Welcome and take it away. Thanks, Ken. How, how's the audio? Does it sound okay? Fantastic. Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone, to What Went Wrong in My Summer Garden. Uh, this is a new class for us. The inspiration for this was uh, several months ago, Karen Moore, who is the master gardener who runs our Linkso speaker series, said, hey, Jonathan, what do you think about doing a class called What Went Wrong in My Summer Garden? And I thought it was a great idea. So uh, this is the first one, and we hope I would I would say we hope to make this uh, an annual event. So why we created this class is to convey the message that things go wrong, even for really experienced gardeners. So I've gotten examples from some of the best master gardeners in San Francisco and San Mateo County. Uh, so things go wrong for everyone. There's a lot of things you can't control, like weather, pests, uh, but there are some things you can, and we'll talk about that. The main message is that gardening requires a lot of patience, adaptability, the ability to, I think, keep track of things, take good notes, understand what worked out, what didn't work out. And finally, just a sense of humor. So we're going to try to keep this humorous if we can um, and just learn from your failures if possible. And then my last point that I've learned over the years is when all else fails, you can always go to the farmer's market and buy your vegetables. How we prepared for this class, I sent out a number of emails to the San Francisco, San Mateo County Master Gardeners, asking them to send me examples of their failures. So they sent photographs with accompanying texts. I put all that together. I kind of filled in a few gaps for some common problems that weren't represented there. Um, and that's what you're seeing today. We have a few examples that came from class attendees if uh, you do have things that you want to bring into the discussion, please put those into the chat and Ken will read them at the end of the, of the class. We'll leave some time for questions there. So let's begin. And um, let's talk about vertebrate pests. I think probably the most examples that we got had to do with vertebrate pests. And whenever I do classes for the master gardeners, I think I get more questions about vertebrate pests than anything else. So let's start off with vertebrate pests. So first of all, chew tomatoes. Okay. Um, so let's do a little analysis of this. Let's look at the chewing marks here. Um, these are pretty big, right? So these are probably the work of some sort of vertebrate pest. Um, I, I would say the most likely culprits are rats and squirrels. Now, there's a good way to tell whether it's rats damage or squirrel damage because rats are nocturnal, squirrels are diurnal, okay? They're more active early in the morning, late in the day, but they're not nocturnal. <clears throat> so, you know, looking at, looking to see when the damage is occurring is a key thing to, to tell you if it's a rat or squirrel problem. Uh, you can trap for both rats and squirrels. Um, I use an electric fence for squirrels. Not really sure if it works for rats. I, I, don't, I really don't think it does work for rats. I think the gaps are too big for rats. But I will say that after many years of 
seeing a wonderful luscious tomato two days away from being fully ripe and off the vine and then seeing it disappear the next day. I will occasionally go out and harvest a tomato a few days early and let it ripen inside in safety. Okay, hole in bell pepper. Um, this is probably not a vertebrate pest. It's a, it's a lot smaller, right? So uh, you can actually see the culprit in the second photograph. Um, this is a very distinctive kind of, um, actually this is an invertebrate pest, this is in the wrong place. <laughs> um, this is an earwig and earwigs are distinguished by these little pincers at the back. Uh, earwigs eat a lot of things, okay? Um, they are nocturnal. They're very much like snails and slugs in that in the daytime, they want to hide out in dark, damp places, and then they'll come out at night. What do you do about earwigs? Um, you can try to eliminate nesting sites. If they're, you know, dark, damp places near your vegetable beds, you can get rid of those. Um, they do recommend trapping where you take a tuna, a small can, tuna or cat food can, um, put about a half an inch of vegetable oil in it and sink it down so that the rim is at soil level. I've tried it. I haven't had much success with it, but I'm sure some people do. Uh, I do use floating row covers to protect a lot of my crops if, if they're low enough. And we'll talk more about floating row covers. Fruit being eaten. Um, can't really tell from this photograph very well. Um, this, I think, is, is a um, peach tree and lots of the fruit is being eaten. Um, this is a pretty obvious one that it's, it's squirrels. Um, anyone who's growing fruit in the Bay Area has this problem with squirrels. Um, there are better and worse places up and down the peninsula. It's gotten really, really bad where I live in Menlo Park. Um, I think it's because of drought and the loss of, of predators, namely hawks and owls. My personal experience has been that if I don't protect my fruit trees somehow, I will lose the whole thing to squirrels. And I've, I've seen that happen in my neighbor's trees. So um, I used to use uh, the, the bird netting, the awful black plastic stuff, until I learned about tool a couple of years ago. Um, tool is a woven synthetic fabric. It's used to make dresses and, and other things. Um, you can buy it by the bolt from a fabric store, and it's really easy to work with. Um, you just drape it over the tree, um, close up all the gaps, and you can use uh, binder clips to clip it all together. And then when you want to get inside and harvest fruit, you just take off the binder clip and stick your arm in and, and harvest fruit. And then even the best thing about tool is uh, it doesn't fall apart each year. You can take it down, store it, reuse it the next year. Now, obviously, um, if you're going to net a whole tree, you've got to keep a compact shape on that tree so that you can get up high enough to drape it over the tree. And you have to think about where the squirrels are coming from onto your fruit tree. So, for example, if it's near a fence, um, are the squirrels running along the fence and jumping onto the tree? Or is there a nearby tree? They're jumping from tree to tree. In that case, you need to protect it from the top. In other cases, if there's no runway nearby, are they running across the ground and up the stem? In which case you need to fasten it at the bottom to protect them. So you need to observe where the squirrels are coming from and, um, and net appropriately. Here's one uh, we got from one of our, our most talented master gardeners. Uh, th these are her corn stalks here. And, and they you can see they've been just chewed off. So there are a number of potential culprits for this. 
Um, rats are probably a good bet. Um, it could be an invertebrate pest. One way to tell is how far it is from the ground because the invertebrate pests are gonna saw things off pretty low to the ground. And also, you know, by the time a stalk's pretty big, uh, an earwig's not gonna be able to chew through that. So um, you, you need to take all those factors into account. Birds love corn seedlings as well, so they can chew them off. Um, so there's a number of possibilities. In this case, the master gardener said rats. I think she's right. Um, and you can't cover corn seedlings with a floating row cover because they're wind pollinated. Um, so a floating row cover is going to keep your pests out, but it's also going to keep out, in, in, in the case of corn, windblown pollen. In the case of your cucurbits, bee-borne pollen. So um, in this case, really your only option is, is to do rat, rat traps. Now, a follow-up to this is that some of her corn stalks did survive, but this is what happened with the corn. And some of you may recognize this if you've grown corn. This is an example of incompletely pollinated corn. Okay, and we'll we'll look at uh, incompletely pollinated cucurbits later in 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 the presentation. So, and the reason these were incompletely pollinated, this is a common gardener error, and that is there's a minimum number of corn plants that you need to have in order for them to pollinate. Uh, because corn is wind pollinated you need sort of a sufficient mass of corn in the general area for them to pollinate. Now, uh, what she said was the minimum number of corn stalks for successful germination with 12 inch spacing between plants is a grid of four, four rows of four, to, of four to the row. So 16 plants, okay? So two thing takeaways here. One, um, with corn, watch for rats going after the stalks. Um, try to catch them with rat traps. And then the other thing is make sure you have a critical mass of corn that you're growing to ensure adequate pollination. <clears throat> okay. Um, bean problems. I got a lot of bean problems. I've had a lot of bean problems myself. So what's going on here? Well, let's let's look. So these are obviously pole beans, right? There's no leaves. No leaves, no flowers, no beans, nothing. Something is chewing off the leaves here. <clears throat> you can see there's a few beans down below, right? So obviously there were leaves at one point, and then somebody has been chewing them off. Um, like with the corn, there are a lot of potential suspects here. Um, birds are, you know, always a prime suspect with beans and particularly pole beans, right? Um, rats can climb pole beans. I've actually caught a rat doing that on a an, an infrared critter cam at night. So a rat absolutely could climb up a trellis like this. So rats are a possibility. Um, I would say rats and birds are probably the most likely culprits. If you buy bean seeds, they often tell you to protect bean seedlings under a floating row cover until they've achieved sufficient height because birds love bean seedlings and they will absolutely chew them off. So that is something I do even with pole beans. I'll cover them in floating row covers until they're at a sufficient height where I can't cover them under the, the floating row cover anymore. You don't have to worry about a floating row cover from a pollination perspective because beans are self-pollinating.
further being problems. Okay, what's missing here? So healthy looking beans, I see plenty of leaves here. I see some flowers down here. There's probably some beans down here. They're looking great. Notice that the leaders are being chewed off here. The leaders are the vines on, on pole beans that climb up the trellis. So in, in most of these stalks here, the leader is missing. Somebody's been chewing the leader. Um, <clears throat> who, again, rats and birds are probably your prime suspect. So here's the thing. If the plants are big enough, they may just form new growth tips. So they won't, you won't be killing the plant. It might slow it down a little bit, but you'll get new growth tips and it'll keep going. Um, if they're too small and, and the growth tips are, are chewed off, it could endanger the whole plant. And then I say at this height, probably a bird problem. I mean, that's got to be, it's a pretty athletic rat uh, and pretty hungry rat to be going all the way up there. And I just thought I'd include this because I just got a lot of responses that were in the vein of, of this email from one of the master gardeners. And, and I'll just read it here. I've been away for the last month. When I left, my garden was coming along with the exception of two successive zucchini plants, which were eaten to the ground by squirrels, rats, or moles. Moles are not likely to eat your zucchini plant. They're, they're more interested in insects, but sometimes you get collateral damage from a mole. Um, they've attacked my tomato plants, stripping and eating green tomatoes. That I say is probably gonna be rats or, or squirrels. My plot is in a large community garden and all the other gardeners are suffering the same issues. So this is very typical of, of a lot of what I got from the master gardeners. And this is just what I hear from uh, a lot of gardeners um, out in community gardens, school gardens, et cetera. So vertebrate pests are a huge problem. As I said, um, you're, your kind of your options are really uh, floating row covers where you can use them, um, traps, um, and and that's kind of about it. I I will say, um, you know, ha having a when I had a dog in my backyard, uh, my squirrel problems kind of went away, so that that helps too. All right, um, can, if we've compiled some vertebrate pest questions, would this be a good time to take them or, or do you wanna to wait till the end? Uh, let's go ahead and wait until the end and then we'll collect more questions and address them. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's talk about invertebrate pests. Uh, we talked about earwigs already. Um, so here's, um, here's a very common problem. Many of you will probably recognize this. Um, so if you look at these Swiss chard leaves, you see these, these papery brown patches in the leaves. It'll, it, it'll be dry and crinkly. You see it over here as well, okay? Um, I'm sure many of you know what this is. This is uh, from the beet leaf miner. And they're called miners because they actually tunnel through the leaves between the top side and the bottom side of, of the leaf, it's the fly larvae that are actually doing that. And um, in my experience, it's, it's much worse in the spring than in other seasons of the, of, of the year. Um, you can get miners on coal crops, your broccoli, cauliflower, cabbages, et cetera, but it, it's most prevalent with this beet leaf miner on um, Swiss chard and, and beets. And of course, beets and Swiss chard are um, related plants. So the good news is that it's not gonna kill the plants. Um, you just remove these leaves. I do find that um, you tend to get infestations on like one plant or adjacent plants, things like that. 
So removing the leaves and um, preventing those miners from moving to other leaves or other plants does seem to work reasonably well. Um, obviously, you're going to have less Swiss chard to eat with these things. And that's really the only impact of, of the beet leaf miner. I, I do know from experience that you can harvest this leaf and cook it and it's, it's fine. It's perfectly fine. And like I said, you just get a little less Swiss chard than you would without the beet leaf miner. Very, very common problem. Pretty much anybody who grows Swiss chard has this problem. I keep all my Swiss chard under a floating row cover and that really reduces the incidence of the beet leaf miner. Tomato pests, you probably recognize these little guys here. Uh, they're white. Um, these are tomato aphids. Aphids are, there are lots of different kinds of aphids. They're very a very common problem. Aphids, again, are generally worse in the spring. They are not going to kill the plant. Um, they accumulate on the underside of the leaves because the moisture in the leaf is closer to the underside of the leaf than the top of the leaf. And that's what they're after is the moisture. So they're kind of drilling up through the bottom of the leaf. So you've got two problems with aphids. One is they're gonna you know, damage the leaves. They make them curl up in this manner here. The other thing is they excrete uh, this sticky black goo, which I, I, you can sort of see here, which is referred to as honeydew. And uh, honeydew, ants love honeydew because it's full of sugar. Um, so you can get an aphid problem that turns into an ant problem. And as you can imagine, if you have black stuff on the leaves, it reduces the photosynthesis from the leaves as well. The good news is that aphids are pretty easy to control. So biological remedy is um, ladybugs, properly known as lady beetles, um, but you can also just hose them down. So if you do have an aphid infestation, just go out there every day, um, take a hose sprayer. If it has like a horizontal spray setting on it, turn it to the horizontal spray setting and get the leaves from the underside and just blast off the aphids. And just, you know, do that every day if you can for the period where you have the infestation. And eventually that infestation will go away. Broccoli pests, uh, pretty much the same thing, right? Uh, underside of the leaves, small white things, different kind of aphid, but they're aphids nonetheless. They're, nonetheless, they're uh, cabbage aphids very common on all the cruciferous vegetables, which includes broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, and kale. If you get this on the young leaves, it could seriously impact the production of the plant. So you do wanna use the same techniques, uh, lady beetles, uh, spraying water, et cetera. Again, again, floating row covers will help. Uh, easier to do on a broccoli plant than, than a tomato. Citrus pests. Okay, here's the underside of a, of a citrus leaf. You got this white stuff. Doesn't look like the aphids, right? It's a little more, it looks almost web-like. Um, this is a, a symptom of white flies. So they're on the underside of the leaf like the aphids because they want the xylem, which is on the underside of, of the leaf. And the xylem is, is the moisture. So if they suck out the xylem, the leaves are gonna dry out. And then that's when they crinkle up and die. Uh, you're also um, gonna, gonna get um, uh, honeydew, right? So you're already seeing some honeydew here black spot. So very similar to aphids in terms of the damage that, that they cause. And this came from uh, the master gardener who submitted it. I pruned most of the bad leaves off. 
and heavy sprayed water from the underside up, and that seemed to do the trick. In my experience, the strong water spray thing really does work, but you have to make sure you do it on the bottom of the leaves. You do it from underside up in order to get rid of the white flies or the aphids. This is from my garden. I, I've got some kale seedlings here. So these guys are being chewed off here. You can see the leaves, this sort of you know sawtooth effect here. So it's different from like a beet leaf minor damage, which it, it comes from the middle of the leaf, right? This is clearly coming from the outside. You know, somebody with some nice teeth is kind of sawing from the outside in. That's a pretty good snail slug indicator. You see that with uh, lettuce most commonly. You know, if it's being chewed off from the outside in, that's generally a good indicator of snails and slugs. So, it, it like I said, it could be earwigs, it could be um, cutworms, the little round roly poly worms. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys out there who will do this to your seedlings. So, you know, what do you do uh, for snails and slugs? Again, you want to try to eliminate any nesting spots nearby, dark, damp places. Um, you can use sluggo. It's copper sulfate. It, it, it is, it, it's, it's perfectly safe. It won't injure your dogs or anything like that. Um, hand picking is very effective for snails and slugs. If you go out at night with a flashlight, um, you will find them if you have an infestation. And you just hand pick them, drop them in a bucket of soapy water, wear gloves. And over the course of a number of days, you will eliminate that snail infestation. Um, it'll come back in a few weeks and you'll need to do it again. But that's a perfectly safe biological control method. Um, you know, some people do the copper strips because supposedly the snails don't like going across the copper strips. I haven't had great success with that, but I think some people do. Once again, floating row covers over all your low green vegetables will just help reduce the number of invertebrate pests that, that can climb in there. Because obviously, if you've got a floating row cover over a, a raised bed and it's well fastened around the sides, a, a snail who's living a few feet away is not going to make it under that thing. So you can see I've got some Swiss chard back here. I've got some mustard greens and some kale. I keep all of that stuff under a floating row cup. And, and my last point here is when the plants are very small, you can lose the whole plant, right? If they do sufficient damage that it just doesn't have enough leaf structure left to do photosynthesis, you will lose the whole plant. Once the plants get taller, like up here, then it, you can stand a little damage and not lose the entire plant. Okay, let's move on to diseases. Um, we'll cover this one here. Many of you will, will recognize this. It's probably one of the most common diseases that we hear about. So um, white powder on squash leaves, Pretty much everyone knows what this is. It's called powdery mildew. Powdery mildew is an airborne fungus. The, the powder itself it are the spores of the fungus. It's an airborne fungus, which means that once it's in the neighborhood, um, it's gonna spread. So once you got it on one leaf, it's going to spread to another leaf and another leaf and another leaf. And, and pretty much there's not much you can do about it. Obviously, you want to remove any infected leaves and try to reduce the amount of transmission. Um, <clears throat> in my experience, once you've got it, it's hard to save the plant because eventually it's going to 
kill enough leaves that the plant won't have enough photosynthesis energy left. Powdery mildew is more prevalent in human environments. So one of the things that you can do is to make sure you have adequate spacing between plants uh, that allows for airflow and sunlight to get in there and dry them out. People often plant their squash plants too close together because you start with a little seedling or a seed, right? And you can't imagine it's going to turn into this giant monster that extends for, for several feet. So um, a lot of times squash plants are too close together. And um, in that case, you're going to be very prone to powdery mildew. If you do have squash plants close together and they're sort of intergrowing the leaves, you can maybe prune some of those leaves to open up some of the space inside. Now there are powdery mildew resistant cucumber and squash varieties. I tried a few winter squash varieties without a lot of luck, um, but they're always improving these all the time. If it's a problem that you have uh, consistently, then I would recommend trying a powdery mildew resistant variety. Just look for that on the seed pack. You're not gonna know that if you go to the garden store and buy a six pack of seedlings. You're not gonna know that it's a powdery mildew resistant variety. It, it might say so on, on the tag, but probably won't. If you want a powdery mildew resistant variety, you're probably gonna have to buy the seeds and plant from seeds because then you'll know for sure it's a resistant variety. And all the squash and, and, and cucur bits are very easy to grow from seed anyhow. Tomato problems. We get a lot of questions about tomato problems. I got a lot from master gardeners. Um, these two photos are actually my tomato problems this year. So you can see some yellowing leaves here. Um, these yellow leaves have some brown spots on them. Um, some of these yellow leaves are turning brown and, and dying up here. So, so what's causing this? Well, unfortunately, there's a lot of things that could be causing this. Too much water can cause tomato leaves to yellow. Too little water can cause tomato leaves to yellow. Then there are all sorts of diseases. The most common diseases are late tomato blight and the two wilts, Fusarium and Verticillium wilt. Those will all result in yellowing leaves that then turn brown and, and die. In this case here, these brown spots could be an indicator of septoria leaf spot. Like the others, that is also a fungal disease. Now, <clears throat> there's not a lot you can do about fungal diseases, but you can do some things to reduce your chances. So one of the things, one of the ways that the fungus gets from the soil to the leaves is when you do overhead spraying, and that caught that just disturbs the soil and you know causes droplets to jump up onto the leaves with fungus from the soil. So if you can avoid overhead spraying, so it's not the leaves getting wet that's the problem. It's the fungus from the soil splashing up onto the leaves that is the problem. So if you can go to drip irrigation versus overhead spraying, that's going to be better because there's no kick up of soil. Uh, it's just droplets going into the soil. So that's one thing you can do to help yourself. A lot of gardeners will, as the plant grows, snip off the bottom, say six inches or so of the leaves from their tomato because those are the ones that are most prone to getting fungus out of the soil and then spreading it up the plant. 
All these funguses, by the way, will overwinter in the soil, which is a big problem. Okay, this one was sent in by one of the class participants. You've got a couple of tomatoes here. There's a lot of brown and dying leaves on these tomatoes. So again, I'm gonna suspect uh, late blight or, or one of the wilts. One way you can tell is that late blight tends to be caused by high humidity, whereas the wilts favor hot weather. And because recently we've had pretty hot weather with not a lot of humidity, I would guess we're probably looking at, at a blight here. Um, sorry, at a wilt. Either way, these plants should not go in. The, I see the compost bin back here. You, these should not go in your home compost bin because those fungal spores are going to survive through there. So uh, you, you want to get rid of these plants. I'll, you'll see on the next slide, the way you can identify a wilt is by cutting open the stem after you've removed the plant. And I'll show you what that looks like. If it is a wilt, then you can't grow tomatoes here any longer. That, that disease is in the soil. It's going to last it in the soil for uh, a few years. And, and the only way you can get rid of it is, is to solarize that soil. So your best bet is to just plant something different in, in this bed. The other thing I would say from the photo is that this, uh, this looks like a fig um, behind it um, is really overgrowing the bed, which means number one, it's shading the bed um, and, and, and number two, um, it could be you know harboring pests that are going to the tomato. So if you want to use this bed going forward, I would suggest giving this fig a hardy uh, pruning over the winter. Figs are very vigorous growers and they can stand a good hard pruning over the winter. When you do remove those tomato plants and you cut open the stem, this is what you're gonna see. This tannish brown dead matter in, in, the, um, in the stem is an indicator of Fusarium or Verticillium wilt, okay? <clears throat> so basically the xylem has died from from the fungus. So that's how you tell if you've got a wilt and if you do, you just can't plant tomatoes or any nightshade family vegetables in, in that bed going forward. All right, I'm gonna take a little water break and then we'll move on to fruit tree issues. Fruit drop. So not actually sure what kind of a tree this is from the photo. I think it's a stone fruit tree of some sort. So a lot of fruit has dropped onto the ground. What does that mean? Well, <clears throat> it's a very common occurrence, um, particularly in apples, pear pears, and persimmons. It's, it's just the premature drop of small fruit. And it's basically nature's way of thinning the fruit. If you're not going to do it, then nature's going to do it. Um, it can, in some cases, be caused by insufficient irrigation. So if the tree's not getting enough water to support all the fruit that it's growing, and the fruit is a very high percentage water, then it's going to drop some of the fruit to help the other fruit survive. Really the best thing to do is to do your own thinning, okay? And just make sure that irrigation is, is sufficient during hot weather. With fruit trees, you don't wanna do like, you know, every other day irrigation like you do with your vegetables. You wanna do uh, much more periodic 
irrigation once every few weeks, but a much sort of deeper, longer soaking um, at those times. In general, fruit drop is not something to worry about. Um, some of these may be edible, but mostly you're talking about your compost bin here. More fruit drop. So this is my netted apple tree. So you can see the tool wrapped around it, and then it's all clipped together with binder clips along the bottom here. It's hard, a little hard to tell from this photograph, but there's a bunch of apples sitting down here. So somehow uh, apples have fallen from higher in the tree and they're, they're down at the bottom. They can't fall out because I've got it completely netted at the bottom. So I'll, I'll just go in, remove that binder clip, let out the apples, throw them in the compost. The question is where, what's going on here? Well, it, it could be just, uh, like I said, fruit drop occurring, just natural fruit drop in the tree. It's also quite possible that I've left some gaps in the netting and the wily squirrels are finding their way up here somewhere. They're, they can either go up this, uh, um, the stem or they can jump onto this tree from another tree. Um, so in my case, I, I investigated, I tightened up gaps in the tool and that seemed to solve my problem. Fruit tree branches breaking. Um, many of us see this, it's really common with plum trees. And, and the cause is just, you've got too much weight uh, on the branches. So once again, it's a thinning issue. Um, and you will see those fruit tree branches just you know, bent over. And if you have that situation, you need to remove some of the weight off that branch or it, it's gonna break. Generally thin fruit is going to be underripe and not really edible. Okay, this is a nectarine tree. And you can see these leaves are kind of curling up here, turning yellow and red, shriveling up. This is a very common problem in the area. If you grow peaches or nectarines or apricots, you're probably quite familiar with it. It's called peach leaf curl. It's an airborne fungal disease. It's really endemic in this area. Eventually, those leaves are going to die. Okay. And then the branches are going to die. You can lose the whole tree. So, sorry. Um, what is recommended? here is that you, um, hold on a second. Okay. Here. Oh, silly. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, what is recommended here is some sort of fungicide applied during the dormant season. Um, there's something called Bordeaux mixture, you can look it up, or um, you can do a copper spray. Um, basically, those are things that coat the leaves. They're both um, considered to be organic treatments, and they're things that just coat the leaves and protect them from the, the airborne fungus uh, landing on them. But like I said, very common problems. A lot of people just kind of give up um, with peaches and nectarines for that reason. Here are Here is a very common pear tree problem. This is what you'll see. This is was sent in by one of our master gardeners. The, the, the leaves uh, turned brown, the leaves and the, the stem turn brown and black and just die. And that's why this thing is called fire blight, because it looks like it's been burned. Um, it's what you can see down below is the remnant of a Japanese pear tree that I have 
that's had fire blight for probably 15 years. Um, it's, it affects apples and pears uh, with pears being particularly susceptible to it. Um, like I said, I've, I've killed one and a half Japanese pear trees in my yard. So I, I will not plant another pear because it's just out there and they're very susceptible to it. Apples, I find much less susceptible to it. Once you've got fire blight, it's really hard to manage. What is recommended is you cut off the branch six inches below any visible damage. The idea being that you cut it off where it's still healthy and prevent any further spread downward on the branch. You do not want to compost those stems and, and leaves, and you want to wash your clippers before you use them again in a 10% bleach solution to kill any fungus on the clippers. But this is, a, like I said, a very, very common problem with pear trees in our area. Persimmon tree problems. So this is also uh, one of my garden failures this year. Here is a perfectly healthy persimmon tree in my backyard. And it's just, it's hard to tell from this photo, but there's one thing that's missing on this persimmon tree this summer, and that is persimmons. Usually I'll get 40 to 50 persimmons off this tree. And you can see it's not, it's not a huge tree. I've I prune it to, to keep it decently sized so that I can net it, I can harvest it, etc. I found one persimmon on it this year. I have no idea why. And this is what makes gardening so much fun, right? There was cool weather during uh, the time when the fruits were forming on, on the tree. That's a possibility. Did I prune it incorrectly. Persimmons are like apples in that the fruit grows on one-year-old wood. So when you prune it, you want to find the new growth from last year and, and prune back to that, okay? So maybe I pruned it badly. Um, who knows? But like I said, this is what makes gardening fun. And if anyone has any great ideas on what why I got no persimmons this year, they, please let me know because I have neighbors who have plenty of persimmons this year. Now we're gonna move on to talk about environmental problems and gardener induced problems. So these are things now that we're getting into where maybe you have a little more control over, over it. <clears throat> Brown tomato bottoms. This is a problem we hear about all the time. People ask about it all the time. I would imagine most of you are very familiar um, with this. It's called blossom end rot, right? What causes blossom end rot? Um, it's caused by insufficient calcium in the plant and by inconsistent watering. Now, note that that means it could be too much water or too little water. So these are things that are under your control. Obviously, if you're overwatering or underwatering, then you can you can correct that, uh, figure it out, and adjust appropriately. Um, many people I know um, use eggshells. Eggshells are filled with calcium, so you know when you use eggs over the winter, um, you can save your eggshells. Put them in the microwave first for a couple of minutes to kill any pathogens, because remember those eggshells still have raw egg on them when after you use them. Um, so just microwave them, uh, put them in a bag, and then they do need to be ground pretty fine, okay? Crumbling them doesn't really work. You, you need to like put them through uh, a food processor or something to grind them down pretty fine. And then just mix that into your soil before you plant the tomato. 
But just bear in mind that blossom end rot will not kill the plant. Um, you've pretty much lost these tomatoes here, but I find it often corrects itself, particularly if you resolve the watering issues. I do find that um, some varieties can be more susceptible than, than others. In particular, I have found this problem with uh, San Marzano tomatoes, which are a form of Italian uh, plum tomato. Bean problems. Uh, one of my garden failures this year, here are some lovely bush beans. They look perfectly healthy, got leaves, got flowers. What's missing? No beans. <laughs> so, um, you know, is it, are they not getting enough sunlight, um, not getting enough water? Um, sometimes if you have too much nitrogen in the soil, that can be a problem because remember, nitrogen gives you nice, healthy green leaves, but nitrogen doesn't help flowering and fruiting. That's what phosphorus and potassium do. So do you have sufficient phosphorus and potassium in your soil? And, and sometimes, you know, the beans are just not ready and you just have to wait. And, and you know, if it hasn't been terribly warm, that could be a problem. And I, I will say these beans did sort of generally straighten themselves out once uh, things heated up. Here's a carrot example from one of our master gardeners. And it's, I think it's a really good example of a common problem that a lot of gardeners have. So here's a, a bunch of carrots um, she pulled out uh, from one section of the garden that are just not fully grown. They're just small, right? And then here's one that is fully grown, much larger. Well, what's the problem here? Well, the problem is thinning, right? Carrots and any root crop need adequate space between plants for that root to grow to sufficient size. So if you don't thin your carrots appropriately, then you're gonna limit what they can do and you're gonna just get small carrots. So once again, the spacing guidelines that are on seed packets are there for a reason. So follow those spacing guidelines. And then my last point is anytime you do thinning and thinning applies to all vegetables, you always need to thin uh, in order to ensure healthy root production in plants, whether they're root crops like carrots or just leafy green vegetables or whatever, um, they need adequate space for the roots. So you need to thin them out, uh, particularly with greens, lettuce, mustard greens, Swiss chard, et cetera, where they're very small seeds and you get a lot of seedlings coming up very close to each other. And there's that temptation to not want to pull out a healthy plant, but yet you, if you want to have you know, good harvest, you have to thin those plants. The one point I'll make is pretty much all those things that you thin out can be eaten. Those tiny little carrots are perfectly edible. Those tiny little mustard greens and lettuce plants, they're what they call microgreens and they're very flavorful. So don't throw them in the compost bucket, just eat them. Here's another good example of thinning. This was sent in by a master gardener who it works with a community garden. And this was a plot in the community garden. And some of you may be familiar with what this person is doing. This is the square foot gardening method where you essentially lay out one square foot squares within a garden bed. It's a very popular technique. You can, you can easily find videos about it online. The problem is they haven't done any thinning. So look at you know, some of these lettuce plots down here. Um, there's just way too many plants. You know, here you've got some lettuce plants that they thin nicely and, and allowed to develop nicely. But many other parts of, of this bed are just 
too crowded for, you know, they're grown really healthy plants, but they're never gonna get fully mature plants. Okay, here's a, another carrot example here. And the, the issue here is soil quality. We have very clay soils in, in our area and clay soils are very dense. They retain a lot of water and it's hard for roots to penetrate a very clay-like soil. So you can see these carrots are either stunted or they're a little gnarly and growing in, in strange directions. And that's because they're finding it hard to poke down into that clay soil. This can be a common problem for people who are gardening, not in raised beds, but in the regular soil in our area. And on the peninsula, we tend to have very clay-like soils. So, your options here are to either garden in a raised bed where you can control the soil, and that's what most people do. If you are going to garden in the regular soil, then you really need to amend that soil. So compost, lots of compost, adding sand, gypsum, those are all ways to improve to you know break down some of that clay in the soil and make it what we call loam which is kind of a nice mix of clay and sand but that's going to take years okay and the, the option is to just um, do a raised bed and as i said you know your root crops you just may want to do in the raised beds where they've just got a much more friable soil that, that they can grow in. And here's, a, um, here's an example. I love this one. This was sent in by one of our most experienced master gardeners. He knows who he is. And um, so this is just to prove that even like, the best of the best can 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 make a, a mistake sometime. So um, if you look at this plot, um, here are these nice, healthy, tall sunflowers down at one end of the plot. And then on the other end of the plot, he's got some uh, corn and uh, looks like some sort of squash down here that, that are very stunted. So so what's going on here? Well, the answer is that he planted the tall plants on the wrong side of the bed. He planted them on the south side of the bed and they blocked the sunlight from, okay, so he's got corn and pumpkins and tomatillos over here. <clears throat> and they were too shaded by the sunflowers. So they didn't grow nearly enough. So this is a, a user error kind of problem. And, and the lesson here is keep your, uh, your taller vegetables and, and plants, whether those are sunflowers or pole beans or, or, or cucumbers, whatever, um, keep them on the north and east side of, of your bed um, so that they're not shading the rest of the bed. So I love this example. I mean, it's it's a it's a mistake that even an even an experienced gardener will make sometimes. Had a lot of cauliflower problems. Okay, what's what's going on with these cauliflowers here? So these these heads are just a little small and 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 spindly. So what's going on here? This is something called buttoning of cauliflower. And what happens is that, you know, these are small, small plants, right? But for some reason it gets a premature flower, which is just not very big instead of the normal big head. 
It's generally caused by some sort of a nutrient deficiency, water deficiency, or quite commonly, it could be just cool weather. And so just not enough heat growing the plant. In this case, it's possible that, I mean, this is looking like some sort of invertebrate damage here, whether it's snails or something else. Um, and that could be reducing the photosynthesis to the plant. It, it's just hard to tell. In any case, it's a perfectly edible cauliflower. It's just not as big as what you were hoping to get. And that's called buttony. Here's another unique cauliflower problem. This guy is turning pink. So what's that about? And is that a disease? It's really kind of like sunburn. Okay, um, it's caused by excessive heat or, or sunlight. And um, it's a perfectly edible cauliflower. Broccoli. So this was sent in by a master gardener. If you look at the broccoli, so we all know that with broccoli that you get an initial flower on the center stem, right? You cut that flower off and then you get new flowers growing out from the sides. This is the center stalk here. It's been cut off, but it's kind of white. It's gotten kind of white and moldy. So what's going on here? So it, it somehow has gotten damp and started to rot. And that's affecting the viability of the side shoots like this. So how do you prevent this? Well, the key message is cut the stem at an angle when you cut off that initial flower. And that way the water doesn't have a chance to collect. If you cut it off flat, the water can collect on, on top there. But if you cut it off at an angle, it doesn't. Cucurbit problems. This, this is a very, very common problem. Uh, inexperienced gardeners get it. Experienced gardeners get it. People have lots of questions. What does it mean when my zucchini, they, they grow a little bit and then they turn yellow and the flower dies and, and, and the zucchini dies? Um, so this is very common and it's a sign of improper pollination. Remember that cucurbits, uh, all the squashes, cucumbers have a male flower and a female flower, and they need pollinators to take pollen from the male flower to the female flower for you to grow a cucurbit. So you need to make sure that you have pollinators. Look and see whether there are bees flying around. Grow plants that attract pollinators. There are lots and lots of perennials and annuals. Um, I'm growing cosmos near my cucumbers. They're, they attract pollinators. I, I also have a lot of budleas, sages, lavenders in general near my garden beds. They all attract pollinators. And, and by the way, um, most of our pollinators around here are not going to be honey bees. They're going to be just wild bees. So make sure you have pollinators. That's number one. Um, if you don't, you can hand pollinate, which is you go out there with a very small paintbrush and you go to the male flower, you rub it in there, you get a lot of that yellow pollen, and you go over to the female flower and you kind of rub it in the center of the female flower. And you want to do this early in the morning when the, the female flowers have opened up their widest. Um, so you can hand pollinate if you don't have any, any pollinators. Here's another thing. Sometimes it's not a problem of, of pollinators, but particularly squash have this tendency where 
you'll either get all male flowers or all female flowers. Um, and, and so you just have no pollination going on. I find that often happens early in the season. Like sometimes you'll get, just get the male flowers coming up first um, before the female flowers show up. That problem does tend to work itself out over time, I found. And, and it can be weather related. As, as well, it, you know, if it's if it's a cool season or something like that, um, these things are not really edible. They're they're basically compost. But this is a very very common problem um, with squat with any of the cucurbits. Here's uh, another cucurbit problem. This was um, sent in by a master gardener, but I have the same problem with with my with my cucumbers. Um, and that is you've got sort of a half formed cucumber, right? Um, this is the same thing. This is probably a poor pollination uh, problem. Um, one of the things I read is that high heat can impact pollination. I do find that this problem is worse later in the year. My early cucumbers are perfect. Later in the year, I start to get a lot of cucumbers that look like this. And so it is possible that the hotter weather is impacting the pollination. It, it could also be water stress because cucumbers are about 96% water. So make sure your plant is getting sufficient water. These are, again, are perfectly edible cucumbers. Um, you're just getting about half as much as, of a cucumber as you would ordinarily. Here's another cucurbit problem that got sent in. So you've got a very yellow cucumber. It, it's not a half size cucumber. This, this is a different variety, obviously. This is more of a pickling cucumber. It looks full size, but it's really yellow. So what's going on here? Um, it's probably an overripe cucumber. Um, cucumbers, when they start to get a little bit of a yellow tinge in them, they are ripe. Take them off the vine at this point. Um, once they get to this point, you're gonna have a very bitter tasting cucumber. This was a, a wonderful example I got from one of the master gardeners. So she planted four Cosmos plants. She, she bought one of them at the master gardener spring seedling sale. This is it back here. It's a lovely, healthy looking Cosmos. She bought three at a nursery, local nursery. And she got these, these, these stunted things here. So what's going on? Um, I'd love to say that the master gardeners have, have healthier seedlings <laughs> than, than the garden stores, and, and that may be it. Um, so, you know, it, notably, they all came out of four inch pots, right? So I, I think the key message here is when you go to the garden store and you buy things in pots, you don't, you know, you, there's a lot you don't know about that plant. And in particular, you wanna make sure that plant is not too big for the four inch pot, because if it is, it's gonna, the roots will be what they call root bound, kind of all curled up into each other because they've got nowhere to go out the bottom. And in that case, it's very hard for a plant to establish a good root structure when it's transplanted. So I'm guessing maybe that's the problem here, that maybe this was root bound when it came out of its four inch pot and, um, and just couldn't develop a good root structure. Whereas I, I bought two Cosmos at the Master Gardener Spring Seedling Sale and mine are like eight feet tall. They're, they're just monsters. So those were not root bound clearly. And finally, um, I just wanted to close with a couple of examples that fall into the category of when all else fails, you just got to keep a sense of humor about gardening.
So this was sent in, this is actually was actually growing in one of the beds in our garden education center in San Mateo. So this is a plot that's been developed and is managed by very experienced master gardeners. And somehow this monster uh, emerged, okay? Um, and by the way, it, some point soon, we are gonna be able to open up the garden education center to the public. And, and when we do, I would highly encourage people to go there. If you're interested, it's up at the San Mateo Event Center in San Mateo. Now, the accompanying email said this was deadly nightshade. I got online, looked up deadly nightshade, and this is not deadly nightshade. I don't know what it is. Um, but I guess my question here is how on earth did they let this thing grow this big <laughs> and, and not notice um, that it was invasive? And then here's my favorite example um, that, that I got submitted. Here we go. This is, this is what the, uh, the gardener sent in a photograph of. These plants have been chewed off here. And here's the story. A cat ate all my cilantro. No joke about the cat. I caught him doing it and he kept coming back till nothing was left but the stems. So I emailed him back and I said, that's going to be a one sick cat. And he responded and said, I haven't seen him since, but I don't know if that's because all the cilantro is gone or because he got knocked out. I kind of felt bad for him. So I figured that's a good way for us to close with, with cats eating cilantro. Just want to mention a few references. I you extensively use the um, UC ANR, as we call it, Integrated Pest Management website uh, in putting this presentation together. You can search by pest, you can search by plant. Uh, here's the, the URL here. I highly recommend it for all your garden problems. This is a book that um, the Master Gardeners use extensively, the Master Gardener Handbook. It is available to the public from UC Agriculture and Natural Resources. There's a lot of great information out there for free from all the wonderful state agricultural extension services like UC Cooperative Extension. And then a lot of um, what I relied on here was just the expertise of the other master gardeners of San Francisco and San Mateo counties. Just a few acknowledgements. I just want to thank Ken, who just does an amazing job, uh, along with Linkso. We we all love Linkso. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Karen Moore, for originating this idea. We'd love to get your feedback. We'd love to hear if this is something you would like to see next year and just get more crazy examples of garden failures over the summer. Um, the photographs were sent in by all sorts of master gardeners. I also pulled some from State Cooperative Extension Services. You can subscribe to our monthly newsletter right here. Um, you can always donate for all the um, free services we, we provide to the public. They're all, it's always appreciated. And then um, for all your gardening issues, I would encourage you to use our helpline. So here's the email address here. Um, these are the in-person hours here. We have three sites, um, but really it's an email process. You send us an email, enclose a few photographs, give us a good description of what the problem is. Uh, we will get back to you generally within a day or two. And, um, we may ask you for more information or something like that. And if we as master gardeners don't know the answer, we will bump it on up to UC Davis. So I will stop there and then we can answer questions. All right, fantastic. Thanks, Jonathan. So we've got a, a few questions here. So I'll go back to the beginning. Um, okay, so... This is sort of a vague question, but I'll ask it anyway. Maybe you'll have some insight. Um, this person had many huge holes in their garden and they're not sure what's digging. 
um, <laughs> those holes. So okay. any ideas? <laughs> Um, okay, so first, can I just pause for a minute to try and get my little puppy out of the garden? <laughs> yes, yes, uh, bring I'll, her I'll in. Right Here, come. You can you can sit. All right. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, holes in the garden. Um, and you know, can if you can just moderate the chat. If people have ideas there, maybe they can just sort of jump on the chat line. It, it, so it, with all of these problems. You know, the first step is observation, right? Is, is, you know, what's going on? Is there discoloration? You know, if if things are being chewed, what does it look like? And then the other thing is, when is it happening, right? That's key because that is telling you, is it a day creature or, or a night creature? Um, there are just so many possibilities. I mean, it, and again, it, it depends on, you know, these little holes or these big depressions, um, squirrels will dig down in, in, in your garden. Um, birds will, will dig down in your garden, um, like cats or dogs, if, if they can get into your garden, will dig down as well. Um, are there any other things that people are suggesting on the chat? Uh, bunnies, you know, when they Bunny. when they have bunnies, burrows, um, gophers, moles, voles. I mean, there's just quite a bit there. <laughs> yeah. So just a few observational things. Moles, moles are not interested in your plants, right? Moles are interested in insects, and they're generally going to tunnel along the sides. And so what you see is you see this slightly raised tunnel, a couple of inches and the soil is pushed aside. So that's your clue about moles. Um, <clears throat> gophers, the telltale sign is um, th this little dirt mound that, that, emerge, that shows up. That's the exit hole for the gopher. And you may like see a gopher head emerge from there at some point. The gophers living in a tunnel about a foot underground but they have these exit holes occasionally. Um, if that's happening in a raised bed and you've got gophers, then you got real problems. And, and we always recommend that when you build a raised bed, before you put any soil in there, you dig down a good, you know, several inches or so, and you line the bottom of the bed with what's known as hardware cloth, which is a, a quarter or half inch mesh uh, a piece of hardware that gophers can't penetrate. Um, and you line the underneath of the bed with that and you staple it to the boards on the ends. And that's how you keep your, your gophers out. So gopher holes are very distinctive. You see those dirt mounds at, at the top of it. All righty. Thank you for that. Um, let's move on to a different topic. Um, you had mentioned a fabric net. And um, mm -hmm. what was the name of that fabric net that you had mentioned? Yeah, so that the trade name is Agribon, A-G-R-I-B-O-N. Um, <clears throat> Agrabon is it, a woven synthetic fabric. It lets in like 95% plus of the sunlight. So your plants can still photosynthesize beneath it. And it is also water permeable so that if you have it over your plants and it rains, the water will get through. Now it may kind of run down the sides, but it'll also drip through there. Agrabon is used for a couple of different things. There are heavier weights of Agrabon 
which gardeners in other parts of the country use to increase the temperature within a bed. So um, they'll cover a raised bed with Agrabon and that'll give them a few extra degrees of warmth in there, which can be really valuable in early spring and late fall if you're gardening in the Midwest or Northeast. We don't really need that here. We don't really need the warmth. Um, in fact, if you do have Agrabon over a bed and you have a really hot day, it can get too hot in there. So here we want to use the lightest weight of Agrabon, which is um, in, it's um, in AG15. That's the lightest weight. Again, you can buy it in very large. Um, it comes in 108 inch wide bolts. Um, you, you can buy them online from garden stores, et cetera. And um, yeah, so that's what that's about. And then you, um, there are a number of ways you can drape it over a raised bed. Some people do, uh, I have number nine gauge steel wire, which is bendable. So you bend it into like a half moon shape and, and stick the ends down into the soil. Um, and you do a few of those along a four by eight bed and you drape the Agrabon over it. And, um, and then you just fasten it down at the ends. Other people use PVC pipes. So you're basically making what they call a hoop house. You're, you're, you know, and, it, and it's gonna be a few feet high off, off the bed. So that's that's what it's called, uh, Agrabon, floating row cover. Okay, thank you so much for that explanation. Um, let's go back to the vermins and what's what do you recommend um, for rat traps that actually work? So like, what's the best type of rat trap that you can recommend? Okay, okay. so first of all, I'm gonna pause here and say that I see the names of several of our most experienced master gardeners on the participant list right now. So you guys out there, feel free to, um, to put things in the chat window that can answer these questions. Um, you're making me really nervous here. Um, rat traps, I'd, I'm not a real expert on, on rat traps. Um, I've had marginal success with rat traps. Um, I have to say I've probably caught more birds in rat traps than rats, which is just horrible. Um, it, so I don't know if there's somebody out there who's like a really good rat trapper, um, please speak up. I do find the old fashioned wood ones really hard to work with and really easy to take your fingers off. And some of the newer ones um, are plastic and much easier to work with. Um, they have these, you know, fancy dancy, expensive battery powered ones, which give them a shock when they go inside. I, they didn't work for me at all. I think, you know, the, the most proactive thing you can do with rats is just trying to eliminate rat potential rat habitat near your vegetables. And that is rats love to nest in uh, overgrown, you know, messy spaces where they can build their nests. So if you can get rid of places like that, that's probably the most effective thing you can do. Are there any other suggestions that are on, on the chat window? I think there's one that says, um... To avoid catching birds, you can put the rat trap under boxes, um, so in a dark place where the birds won't be able to go. Okay, all right. <clears throat> okay, what else, what else you got? Ken, are you there? 
Oh, this whole time I was talking. I'm sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Let's. Uh, um, next question is relating to corn, growing corn. Can you cover at night and uncover during the day so they get pollinated? Okay, I'm not a corn grower, but I know. So, the the corn example specifically came from Carol O'Donnell, and Carol O'Donnell is in the class right now. So if you can unmute Carol, um, perhaps she can answer the question. I'm sorry, Jonathan. Um, they won't be able to unmute, um, but oh, they okay. can type in via chat. Um, okay. And then they're more than welcome to contribute that so way. So the question is, can you cover corn in the evening um, to prevent rats, but it'll uncover in the daytime to allow them to pollinate? I believe so, yeah. Okay, I'll and I'm gonna defer to Carol if if she's there. Um, my sense says um, that probably would work. I mean, it's it's just it's just it's just a lot of extra work, right, to take it on and off every night. Um, is anybody volunteering a response? Or any corn growers out there? Yeah. Well, we'll monitor the chat for that. Okay. Um, we can we can move on. Um, so let's uh, let's uh, go to a next question. Um, uh, this person, Scarlet Runner Bean, have plenty of blossoms, but very few beans, and they're wondering why. Yeah, so that's like the example um, that I showed uh, of you know perfectly healthy bean plants and no beans. So. It, there are just a lot of possibilities there. Like I said, could be too much water, could be too little water. The way you check for that is you stick your finger in the soil, right? If if you're not, if it, you're not feeling some moisture down a few inches and it's not cooling down a little bit, then maybe you're not giving enough water. So you've got that. If you stick your finger in there and it just feels really damp, then maybe you're overwatering. Um, then, you know, check nutrition, make sure they're getting adequate phosphorus and potassium, which are P and K in, in fertilizers. And then the final thing is it may just be an environmental problem, right? It, it may just not be warm enough for bean production and, and you just need to wait a little bit. But again, beans are self-pollinating, so it's not a pollinator problem. Alrighty. Um, next question is, if you had a wilt, then any nightshade can't be planted there for several years, question mark. So I guess, can you plant nightshades if you have a place where there's wilt? No, no. So okay. no tomatoes, no peppers, no eggplants. Yeah. And yeah. if the fungal spores survive in the soil, what should they do with the soil um, to remove it? Should they sanitize the soil? Um, this person's growing tomatoes in pots. And they're wondering so, if it's safe. Yeah, so, so my tomatoes have migrated over the years into pots. Um, and one of the reasons for, well, there are a couple of reasons. One is, you know, you can locate pots in those particularly sunny spots of your yard because tomatoes need a lot of sunlight, right? The other thing is you can control the soil in pots in a way that you can't in, in your native soil or, or in a raised bed. So my tomatoes have tended to migrate um, to pots over the years. And so if you're growing your tomatoes in a pot, Obviously, if you get a wilt in 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 that tomato, then you discard that soil, right? Um, you, you know, you don't want to use it again. Um, and and just th then the key thing is make sure you sanitize that pot with a ten percent bleach solution at the end of the season. Sanitize it, wash it out thoroughly. Then the next year you can put new potting soil in there, you'll be fine. For your, if the wilt is in your bed, 
then what you have to do is what they call solarizing the soil, which is, is basically, um, you can look it up online, but you basically, you know, are spreading something over the soil to, you know, like black plastic over the top. It's just going to absorb sun, heat up the soil to a temperature that's going to kill the fungus. That's basically what you do. Okay. Um, now, my, it, it, oh, sorry, Ken. You know, mind you, you can still grow non nightshade family vegetables there just fine because yeah. the, the fungus won't attack those. So here's a follow up question to that. So if a tomato plants, uh, plant leaves are wilting, um, it could either be too much water or not enough water. So how do you tell which is which? Um, so again, yellow leaves can be a symptom of too much water. Um, if they're wilting, that suggests to me that they're a little bit dry. So again, you know, is it a water problem or is it a disease problem, right? If, so the key word here is wilt. <laughs> If they're brown and wilting, then that's a potential disease problem. If they're just droopy, but still green, that's more likely a watering problem. So, and there's an easy way to tell, right? Water the bed or water the container, the, the leaves perk up, you knew it was a watering problem. Okay. Um, Containers, if you're growing tomatoes in containers, you need to irrigate much more frequently than in, in a regular raised bed because there's less soil to hold water in there, right? It's just a smaller volume. And so you tend to have that problem more frequently with smaller containers that they just dry out and you need to water them. And again, use the finger test, stick your finger down there. If it feels dry for an inch or two, then they probably just need watering. Okay. Next question is, um, this person has root knot nematodes and besides solarization, what else can they do to help eradicate that? Oh gosh, I am not an expert on root knot nematodes. Um, so if there is someone, one of the master gardeners who wants to chime in about root knot nematodes, that would be great. Again, this is the kind of thing where the uh, UC ANR integrated pest management website can be really helpful. If you go to the link that I have in the presentation, and just type in root knot nematode, um, they'll, it'll give you all the information you need about you know, the causes and the treatment. Okay. Um, these two are related to, uh, actually the next three questions are related to fruiting, but three different fruit trees. First being persimmons, only fruiting every other year, not every year. Um, second, orange tree uh, that's dying and wondering if orange trees, should they be pruned now? Um, should the dead branches be pruned back or wait until it's cooler? Um, should they water more, feed more? What's going on with that? Um, and then the other one, well, I guess this third one is also a persimmon tree. The fruits never really mature. So lots of fruiting issues mm -hmm. here. Okay, never really mature. Not quite sure what that means exactly. I, I, mean, I guess they get lots of fruits and they never get bigger than about an inch in diameter. And it's been going on for many years. Um, interesting. Um, yeah. If it's a healthy tree, then, you know, I, I suppose, you know, it could be a nutrient problem in the soil. So maybe you need, a, a, you know, a good 
fruit fertilizer application in the spring. Um, it, maybe it's just shaded, right? Maybe it's it's just not getting enough sunlight um, where it is. Um, in terms of the every other year issue, um, you know, this I don't know how well this is researched, but you know many fruit trees are sort of prone to this good year, bad year kind of thing. And I have, I have heard it, heard about it with persimmons. So, um, and, and I'm sure if I did the research, there's a good explanation for it. So that it, that does um, tend to happen sometimes, but in terms of why you wouldn't be getting um, mature fruits, or if you're just, if it's you know sort of a lot of spontaneous fruit drop, um, th that suggests to me it could be you know a water an irrigation issue, um, or, or a nutrient problem or a sunlight problem. Um, in terms of the orange tree, you know with citrus, um, you know they're very prone to getting yellow leaves, right? Um, Again, it can be an overwatering problem or an underwatering problem. Often with citrus, it's a nutrient problem. So make sure it's, it's getting adequate fertilizer. And citrus, you, you do want to prune in the summer, uh, unlike, um, uh, unlike you know, most of the rest of our fruit trees, which you want to prune during the winter dormant season. Because citrus don't go dormant in the winter, right? That's that's when the fruit come out in the winter. So um, you actually want to prune them back in the summer. We still have a couple more weeks of summer, or maybe one or two more weeks of summer. So that would be a good time, huh? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. All right, so let's go to soil. So nurse, nursery plants all seem to be, you know, planted in peat. Um, and once it gets dry, it's nearly impossible to rehydrate and it can stump the plant. Mm -hmm. um, master gardeners plant in soil. So could you maybe talk a little bit about soil versus peat-based media? Um, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, we do have a, a mixture that we use when, when we do our, our seeding for the spring garden sale, but I'm not privy to the actual recipe there. Um, I, I, I don't know if any of the master gardeners online are are, um, are are knowledgeable about that and can volunteer something. Are, you, are any of them stepping up, Ken? I'm not sure. Let me, you know, if they are, I mean, there's a lot of great information in the chat down there. So folks mm -hmm. can definitely read up on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but just for the timing purposes, let's um, let's move on to a few other questions. So, so um, I, 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 I do want to just just say one thing. So first sure. of all, <clears throat> there's there's a lot of good information online that you can find about making your own planting mixtures and um you know one of the things that is often in homemade planting mixtures is is a um a very small stone called perlite and 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 per one of the the properties of perlite is that it's a moisture attractor and so when you mix small amounts of perlite in with the in with the soil when you're doing a planting mixture, it has the ability to attract moisture, which is you know the opposite of that peat problem. And so that's why a lot of people will put perlite 
in, into a, a planting mixture. Okay. Alrighty, let me go back. Oh, there's so many. Okay, there we go. Back to tomatoes. Um, do you prefer growing tomatoes from seed um, or buy from a nursery? Okay, well, um, you know, we, we have a lot of, a lot of tomato growers um, in the class here. Um, you know, Karen, who's the one who organized this class, I know Karen grows from seed. I don't know if she grows from seed exclusively. Um, I do a mix. Uh, I do some from seed and then um, I do some I'll do seedlings. Um, the, the seedlings from our own sale in April are generally quite good. Uh, I sort of know, you know, where they're coming from and how they've been cared for and, and all of that. So, um, so, so I, I tend to trust th those seedlings. Um, but, you know, I've gotten seedlings from commercial nurseries that are perfectly good. When I grow from seed, it's often because it's a variety I want to have that I can't find at, a, at, at the master gardener sale or at a nursery. So, um, so that's when I'll grow from seed. You, you know, growing from seed, you have the most control over the environmental conditions that in, compared to buying from a nursery, right? Um, the trade-off is that it's it's a lot of work to do that. First, you know, you have to have a good planting mix, you germinate them, um, then you need to give them adequate light, um, you need to give them air. Um, it's, it's actually important with those tomato seedlings that you um, blow a fan on them to um, have some airflow that helps them develop sturdy stems, uh, etc. Um, then you've got to harden them off, you know, gradually taking them outside to get them used to going outside. So it's a lot more work to do from seed, but you absolutely have the most control over over the results. So, like I said, I do I do a mixture. I think Karen said she prefers to grow from seeds, um, and so do I. I think they're they're fun, and you can get um, a lot of different varieties that way. Um, Absolutely okay. agree. <clears throat> Let's see. I lost my question here. <laughs> okay, rice beds. Um, how deep should a rice <clears throat> planter bed be? What do, What is your recommendation? I know people have several different recommendation here, but um, what do you prefer a, a good race garden bed to be depth wise? Yeah, so um, some of it's out of your control. Um, some of us have soils that are so clay-like that you can only go down so far. Um, and first of all, the time to build a raised bed is in the winter. I mean, if you try to do it in the summer, that soil is just too hard. So, you know, once you've had sufficient rainfall and can actually get a shovel into, into the soil, that's the time to build your raised beds. Uh, I think if you can go down a foot, that's great. Um, if you can't go that far, then, you know, as deep as you can go. And then just make sure that you um, line it with hardware cloth on the bottom. Um, make sure that any wood you're using um, doesn't have um, harmful chemicals in it. In the old days, pressure treated wood had arsenic in it, which you obviously don't want around your vegetables. I believe that's no longer true anymore. Um, redwood, of course, is rot resistant and great for raised beds, but it's very expensive. Um, 
And there's a lot of good information online on how to build like your basic four foot by eight foot raised beds. Um, Sunset had a, a great um, example online for many years. I think you can still find that if, if you Google around for it. All righty. Um, thank you for that. I lost my question here again. Oh, there we are. You mentioned that you have cameras. Um, could you share with us what brand of cameras that you have? Camera? That's what it says. Okay, the person may be referring to the critter cam. Yes, um, correct, yes. Critter camps, yes. I have no idea because I borrowed it from a neighbor. <laughs> but <laughs> basically what a critter cam is, is a, a camera that operates in the infrared range so that um, you know it can spot things in darkness and it, it's motion activated. So you just set it up. And so in my case, you know, I had something eating my, my pole beans. And so I just set it up, looking up at the pole beans. And, um, you know, the next day I see that at two in the morning, a couple of um, photographs were taken and there were a couple of beady red eyes re reflected there, which was probably a good indication of a rat problem. So that's all I know about, about critter camps. Okay. Um, and going back to the agrabon uh, that you had mentioned, uh, can critters chew through that, like squirrels and stuff? I, I haven't seen much of it, well, although I will say um, it's easy to tear agrabon. Like it can get caught on the corners of your raised beds or any number of things. And it's a very, very lightweight fabric. So it's easy to tear. And of course, once you've got tears in it, then, you know, critters can possibly find their way through. Um, I had a piece of old Agrabon that I was reusing that was torn in one place. And one day I was out in the backyard and I saw a crow literally ripping off more of the Agrabon to presumably take for a, a nest somewhere. Um, but I've never seen a squirrel or anybody else chew through it. Okay, that's good to know. Um, let's go back up here. Got a lot of critter questions and suggestions. Yeah. We've got a lot of critters on the peninsula. Yeah, and you know, um, we have, uh, a master gardener class it's a two-parter that we do on uh vertebrate uh pests so i think it might be on our recorded class session too so people can refer to that as well yeah. good um you know we have 10 more minutes but let's get a couple questions going here and then we'll we'll wrap up um could you talk about setting up electric fences um do you recommend them do you have any experience with them yeah, so I have used an electric fence around my raised beds for a number of years now. Um, so just for those of you who don't know, an electric fence is a fence that is powered either by uh, alternating current, in which case it's plugged into an outlet, or direct current powered by batteries. and it sends a periodic um, pulse through wires, through metal wires that you've strung up around your garden bed. And it's not of a sufficient power to kill anything, but it's gonna give a little shock, enough of a shock so that an animal, whether that's a cat or a dog or a squirrel, is going to feel that and go, you know, so, you know, this is probably not somewhere I should be. Okay. And you can put your finger on it and feel it. It's going to give you a little, a little shock, not a big shock. Um, it's a little bit of work to set this up, but after a number of years, you, you kind of get the hang of it. Um, it 
if you know you're looking to buy the parts of it, all I will say is that um, you can pretty much find everything on the website of a very large online re uh, retailer. Um, the ones I have are powered by two D batteries because I find that just easy. You know, electric fences are used a lot by people who are doing ranches. So you'll see things online that, you know, will power, you know, two miles of fencing. And, that, you know, that's for horses and cows and, 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 you know, animals like that. We're just talking about here, short distances, low power. So mine are powered by D batteries. Um, and then you have to run the wire from the power source um, all, all the way around. And you have to make sure that they're close enough together so that the squirrels can't get through. Um, so I, I buy these stakes um plastic stakes that are probably like three feet high they have multiple little lips on them where you can feed the wire through and then you just run the wire in in concentric um rectangles around the bed i believe that they work and the reason i say that is because when i do get squirrel damage on my tomatoes I invariably go out there and find that I had turned the um, the power source off. So that that's my way of coming to the conclusion that when it's when they're turned on, they are actually deterring the squirrels. Alrighty, perfect. Okay, so there are quite a lot of questions that were already answered by the other master gardeners in the chat. So thank you so much for that. Great. Um, it's really fantastic. Did we, um, did we get an answer to root nematode? I think we got a link um, if I scrolled up. Um, okay. Oh yeah, there's, an, uh, there's a question here regarding uh, tomatoes and uh, the flowers drying off um, and they've been watering it really well. This is the last question, by the way. And they're wondering if this may be due to the heat wave that we had. Last yeah, I was, I was just going to say that. Yeah, I mean, I've been getting a lot of that recently too, and it's just too hot for yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, that's pretty much all of it. And, you know, all the other questions, you can definitely send them in to the Master Gardeners that we didn't get a chance to address it today um, mm -hmm. or reach out to Jonathan directly um, or call the Master Gardener hotline. Um, Jonathan, do you have any summary closing summary for everybody before we sign off here so i just want to say one thing and that is as i said at the beginning this is the first time we've offered this topic in a class so we would be particularly interested in your feedback on this class let us know if you think this is something we should offer again yeah that's that's really good to know. And you can just email us, um, email the Master Gardeners or myself or Jonathan, and, and we'll go from there. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending. This class is being recorded and will be posted on our website under Community Resources. Um, so look for that tomorrow. So it'll be live. And uh, thank you, Jonathan, for our fabulous class, as always. Um, and I'm sure we'll do this class one more time. I mean, we'll, we have a lot of a lot of questions that needs answers. So maybe we'll do some research and um, do a follow-up to this class as well. But thank you to everybody. And thank you, Jonathan and Karen for putting this class on. We'll sign thank off you. now. Thank you, Ken. Okay, bye-bye everyone. <laughs>